Hello there and welcome to your midweek edition of Ireland AM. Yes, it's Wednesday the 6th of September and we're thrilled to have you with us all morning and here's what's coming up. So we spoke about this yesterday. It was the brand new report that has shown that over 40% of school children have yeah. experienced cyberbullying. I think it's like 20% like parents give them their phone and then there's no mm. checks or balances on it. So we're going to be discussing this shortly with people involved in the report and what it is that we can actually do. And if this is something that you think is an issue in your home, in your classroom, we would love to hear from you this morning because it just feels overwhelming. 0896 111 That's coming up at 7.15 this yeah, morning. Do get in touch with us and we're going to meet a TikTok star and disability rights activist who's using her voice to inspire others. Brilliant. And we're debunking common misconceptions about living more sustainably. The straw thing is... The straw thing. The paper straw. The paper straw. straw. So apparently the paper straw, the, the, the glue and plastic that's used in it is a carcinogen. So, you know. We were all using it and it wasn't, wasn't doing us any good at all or the planet any good. So we're going to scare no. you at about I'm 9 o'clock. I'm telling you, yeah. Now, yeah. Tommy is not here this morning because where is he? Well, he's dusted off his clubs and perfected his swing ahead of the <laughs> Pro-Am <laughs> at the K Club today. Tommy, how are you getting on? Looks lovely there this morning. How are you guys? It is absolutely stunning here this morning. Yes, I am at the K-Club golf course here in County Kildare for the Horizon Irish Open. It is going to be a really action-packed couple of days over the next four days. If you are close by, if you're a big fan of golf, make sure to get down here because the great and the good of the golfing world are here. The likes of Rory McIlroy, Shane Lowry, Podrick Harring, to name, to name but a few, and you'll be able to get really up close to them. Now, today I'm going to be talking to some golfers. I'm also going to be talking to some other sporting Royalty coming up later this hour. I'm going to be talking to All Ireland winners, the Limerick hurling captain, Keen Lynch, along with Dublin footballer Dean Rock. Later on, uh, football royalty David Clifford's going to stop by for a chat with Conor Moore, also known as Conor Sketches. And then finally, in the nine hour, I'm going to be getting the lowdown on Ireland's World Cup chances with Rory Best, Joey Carberry, and to tee it off, you're going to get to see me driving on the first tee uh, live on air. What could possibly go wrong? I'm actually really looking Aloft. forward to that. It's going to be amazing. Aloft. It's going to be really, really yeah, good. If there are people there, uh, be careful because uh, don't be standing anywhere near me. Near you, yeah. <laughs> he says that now. You know he's so good at it. Tommy, we'll See talk to you in just a little while now. Of course, he's going to be talking about the World Cup chances. It's going to be 37 degrees, I think, in the stadium where Ireland are this weekend. Irish Not people, here, though. Irish people aren't going to be... Well, you never know. It's been boiling. Derek, we're being spoiled we with the weather. Is it, is it stay? Spoiled. Yeah, do you know what, guys? Well, following the last few days, and they have been glorious across the country, it looks like it is breaking out there today, especially across the western half of the country. Some heavy, thundery downpours uh, through parts of the Midwest and across the southwest as well. So it looks like our Indian summer is coming to an end. By the way, how come time it gets all the posh cakes? <laughs> Thanks very much, Derek. Talk to you later. Now oh. let's go up to the Virgin Media News. Up here is Anne O'Donnell. Thanks, Alan. Good morning. Well, a post-mortem is due to be carried out on the body of a young girl that was recovered from the water off the Cork coast following a search operation yesterday. Well, the eight-year-old went missing while she was swimming near Crosshaven yesterday evening. To the US now, where the former leader of the extreme group, the Proud Boys, has been sentenced to 22 years in prison. It comes after the attack on the US Capitol. Well, it represents the longest sentence handed down yet in a case stemming from the 6th of January. Well, while we respect the judge's sentence, uh, we respectfully disagree, but yet we respect it. Um, there'll be a day and a time where an appeal will come and we expect the appeal to come soon. Um, and whoever handles it will be handling the, the issues that transpire with and we will be filing the appeal in due course. Michal Martin's trip to the Middle East continues today with a visit to Palestinian territory. The Thonishta will meet with President Mahmoud Abbas in the West Bank as he continues to bid to revive the peace process in the region. Well, our political correspondent Gavin Riley is in Jerusalem. 
Usually the theme of foreign visits by leading Irish politicians is to underline common ground between Ireland and the country they're going to. That wasn't so much the case yesterday. Micheál Martin finding himself somewhat at odds with the Israeli Premier Benjamin Netanyahu and the Foreign Minister Eli Cohen about the Middle East peace process currently stuck in logjam. Ireland wants to reinstigate that peace process but it does want a sustainable two-state solution, a globally recognised Israel and a globally recognised Palestine and it doesn't believe Israeli illegal settlements in the latter are helping that cause. Today, Miho Martin goes into the West Bank and Ramallah to see some of those illegal settlements constructed by the Israeli government. He'll also visit the current president, Mahmoud Abbas, and visit a museum dedicated to his predecessor, Yasser Arafat. It's day two of a three-day visit to the Middle East. One suspects the Tanisha will get a slightly more welcome reception than he did in Jerusalem yesterday. Gavin Riley, Virgin Media News, Jerusalem. Well, Ukrainian refugees are beginning to arrive and settle into temporary accommodation in County Leash. The Thonishta has admitted that it's not ideal that people are to be accommodated in tents at the electric picnic site. However, he says it'll only be for six weeks. Up to 700 pe 750 people are due to take up residence there by tomorrow due to an accommodation shortfall. Locals in Strad Valley say for humanitarian reasons, the stay needs to be short term. Terrible to have to look at and say that these, these women and children are going to have to sleep in these tents for a number of weeks. Like, as you know, the electric picnic has only moved away after the weekend. And uh, talking to the young people that were in there for the weekend, while they loved it and enjoyed it, and it was the best picnic we had in 20 years. The one downside of it was it gets very cold at 5 o'clock in the morning when you wake up in that tent, you know. So you can imagine what's going to be like with temperatures dropping in over the next number of weeks. So I would like to think that we won't have, uh, it'll all be short, say, for all these individuals, you know. At least seven people have been killed in rainstorms in Greece, Turkey and in Bulgaria. Elsewhere in Europe, cleanup operations are underway after deadly flooding also wreaked havoc in central Spain, including in the capital, Madrid. Here's the latest. The destruction is clear. These drone images show the aftermath of deadly floods in central Spain. Flood water turned streets into rivers, collapsed bridges and buildings, swept away vehicles and even took lives. In the capital, Madrid and in surrounding areas, a cleanup is underway as locals try to come to terms with what's transpired. Here in El Alamo, residents were forced to dive into waters in the dark early morning hours to pull neighbours out of flood inundated houses and cars. Catastrophic, the most terrifying day of our lives. You could hear people screaming, asking for help, but we couldn't do anything. We felt helpless hearing the screams. The final cost to rebuild here could run into the tens or even hundreds of millions of euro. But for now, the people here are just trying to salvage what they can and in some cases mourn for those who have been lost. Hannah Lamas, Virgin Media News. You need to be chill to handle Irish weather. That's why Chill sponsor weather updates on Virgin Media. Thank you, Jaron. A very good morning. We're live with you here in studio this Wednesday and following those glorious few days we've been having. It looks like it's going to break out there today. So let's take a look. By the way, is it how it's shaping up now with Derek O'Neill with us on cameras? And we do have a misty and quite a foggy start out there this morning. Good deal, cloud cover, especially across the southern half of the islands through parts of the Midlands. The further north we go, then in across uh, the uh, parts of Ulster through parts of Leinster. That's where we're going to see the brightest of those breaks out there now this morning in those moderate southerly winds. Valleys there, 18 in Letter Kenny and 19 in Waterford as the new day breaks. Now, right across the day, it looks like, in fact, uh, we will see that east-west split across the country. Some really nice uh, bright spells, some really good September rays extending there through parts of the Midlands in across eastern and southern regions. But through parts of the west, then, that cloud cover building, and we will see some downpours, uh, heavy thundery downpours, in fact, for a time, stretching uh, through the Midwest and across the southwest as well. So do be mindful of that if you are out and about heavy once again and muggy in terms of those temps. So Tom Fanny's over around 19 to 24, even uh, 25, uh, possibly 26 degrees out there today. Now, into tonight, it looks like sharing for a time. Once again, some sundry downpours elsewhere. Cloud cover beginning to build there through parts of the east in across central and southern regions with overnight lows again on the muggy side, back to 17 to 18 degrees there in Sligo. So that's how we're shaping up for now. We'll be back again live at 7.35. You need to be chill to handle Irish weather. That's why Chill sponsor weather updates on Virgin Media. 
It is time now to take a look at this morning's papers. We'll start with the Irish Times. It's headline, Ireland risks repeating mistakes of past warns watchdog. The Irish Fiscal Advisory Council has warned that the government risks undermining its credibility if it presses ahead with plans to breach its own spending rules each year until 2026. Speed limits to be slashed on roads, that's the front page of the Irish Independent. Cuts are set to be made on many roads as authorities seek to reduce the number of road deaths and serious injuries. The examiner also leads with this story, speed limits uh, to be uh, cut to save lives on roads. Limits will be lowered by 20 kilometres on many national, local and arterial roads across the country. Tensions rise over strategy to house refugees is the top story of the Daily Mail. Issues have flared among councillors who voted against dozens of modular homes, over 200 Ukrainians putting the, government, uh, the government's refugee strategy under renewed pressure. The Herald goes with teen accused of head stamp attack denied bail. A young man pictured there on the front page who punched a tourist to the ground and stamped on his head in a vicious and unprovoked attack on a group in Dublin city centre was refused bail and remanded in custody yesterday. The mirror goes with girl eight dies in sea swim tragedy. A community has been left heartbroken after the body of a young girl was recovered in a major search operation off the coast of Cork. The alarm was raised just after 4.30 when she was swimming with friends and came into difficulty. The star leads with Let's Shake On It. Guard the Chief Drew Harris is in Dubai to secure a deal to extradite and charge the Kinnahans over major crimes. This comes as Guard the await a decision from the DPP on charges for all three Kinnahan leaders. And The Sun also covers this story with the Kin Blue Line. Now, up next, uh, we spoke, it was in the papers yesterday. Mm -hmm. It's a new report that states that 74% of teachers see online safety as a significant issue in their school. They're talking about cyberbullying, yes. that they can see kids being cyberbullied all the time. And we're going to get advice for any concerned parents after this break. <laughs> Thanks for staying with us now. A new report has revealed that the rate of cyberbullying rises significantly in secondary school and that girls are more likely to be victimised than boys. Uh, this was a report that was out yesterday and we were talking about it and mm -hmm. some people were getting in contact and they know that their kids are being bullied. If you want to get in contact with us today uh, to let us know what the reality is, 0896 111 uh, here to talk us through the findings of the report and how we can support children who may be experiencing cyberbullying or CyberSafe Kids CEO Alex Cooney and family psychotherapist Richard Hogan. Thank you both so much Good for morning. being here and unfortunately we see these reports all the time Alex and it's getting worse and worse every year so I'm just wondering this this form of online bullying it's experienced by so many children in this country what form does it take this cyber bullying yeah so we list a, a range of experiences that amount to cyber bullying because actually some behaviors children don't even recognize as, as bullying so things like being left out of, of, of a chat group would be very right. common. Mean messages being sent to you, mean messages being posted about you, uh, fake accounts of where somebody sets up an account in your name and then uses it to bully or humiliate you, uh, photos and videos being shared without your consent. You know, these are sort of the sort of behaviours and children, when we, uh, when we do the survey, we ask them to tick any experience that's been applied to them over the last year and a number of children would tick multiple experiences. And girls are more likely to be victimised by this. Why is that? So actually, it, it, that trend emerges at secondary school. So we saw about a quarter of primary school children had experienced bullying, and that rises to 40% of secondary school. And that's where we started to see the difference. So it was significantly more girls than boys. And I think it's probably to do with their use of social media. A lot of this bullying is happening on social media and instant messaging apps. And, you know, they're just more active in those spaces than boys than the are. boys are. Mm. Well, because that's one thing we know that boys are more, it points to boys be more online gaming yeah. and girls or more on, on, on social messaging. But we were just looking at yeah. this. 8 to 12 year olds, 84% have their own social media account. A lot of this, is, there's no oversight. They're just giving their phone and off they go. With 76% having access to YouTube. Mm. Richard, I'm going to be honest, like, this seems mad. 8 to 12 year olds. Well, here's the reality. None of us working in the field were surprised with any of these stats. We've been saying this for years. You know, I work with families all the time and you see this stuff all the time. But an eight-year-old. I, I, absolutely, Anna. You cannot outsource your parenting to these devices. In the 80s, they used to have this warning about Bosco saying you can't outsource your, your parenting to yeah. Bosco. And these devices are so 
that's so problematic. But should they put on the parental controls, blah, da, 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 da? They don't work. No. Well, the kids get around them so quickly. They, they outmaneuver. I mean, they're digital natives, and we are, in our group as parents, yeah. immigrants here with this yeah. thing. And so we don't understand it properly. We, don't, we, don't, we haven't grown up with this thing. And there are huge problems there. And we need, we need a shared responsibility. Schools are so important. And when, when the joint system of school and family comes together, we can have a really powerful outcome here. It's not beyond us, it's not, Alex. No. I mean, it, it is solvable here. But we have to, first of all, look at our parenting and look at our, you know, what, what, what our child is doing online. 85% uh, or something from the report said that 85% of parents weren't sure what the child was doing. Now, that is a staggering statistic. And that we need to upskill parents. We need to train. We, we do need training. We need, we need more programs that talk to parents and, and empower them because they feel fearful about this stuff. They don't understand it. And one of our reactions, psychologically speaking, is to avoid mm. when we feel a bit of fear. So don't talk, don't talk about it. It's Just, grand. It'll be grand. Because we, we were getting texts in yesterday from teachers who said that they can spot yeah. when something is wrong in a class yeah. because the child's demeanour changes. So should we be looking out for it? Should parents be looking out for that for their, their, their children? Oh, absolutely. Teachers need to be upskilled as well. There needs to be more restorative practice going on there in their training, in the teacher training, but parents need to look out for your child. And one of the key tips, Alan, is that if your child becomes a little bit, um, say, if there's a rupture in their peer group and if they're not going out anymore and they're up in their room a bit more, that then you'd know there's something happening in their peer group. And it can happen so quickly. And it's, you know, what you said about girls, it's so insidious. I work with it all the time. Mm -hmm. It's so insidious that you get pushed off a, you know, a Snapchat group and then a WhatsApp group and all of a sudden you've got nobody in your life. And that can be a pervasive thing for a teenager whose whole world is to be connected to each other. Yeah. yeah. Because I suppose I've been looking at reports on this and it is that our brains aren't evolved enough to handle this. Of like course. it's... It, there's so many social peer groups where previously and for millennia we have had one social group and now there's so many. So we're not there, but in all of this, there's only so, like, how many times have we been talking about this, Richard? It's getting worse and worse. <laughs> no. Is there any corporate responsibility here on these companies? Because they have, YouTube makes billions, 11 billion mm. in profit. They don't have enough moderators. They're not doing anything about this. A lot of these companies are, are reporting profits in the billions. So absolutely, they have a responsibility and they absolutely are not doing enough to uh, address child safety on their platforms. I do think that that will change. I do think that will really? change. Really? And we were talking about this uh, yesterday. You know, we hope that in 10 years, this will all look really different. You know, if we are properly preparing children and equipping children to be online, and that's going to involve really good parenting, and it's going to involve our education system, you know, supporting and educating children. And if we make sure that the online uh, safety, co or the companies, sorry, that are providing mm. these services are ensuring that they are making those spaces safe for children, so that's going to in include things like age assurance, you know, this will all look very different. But we do need to uh, properly address it, invest in solutions. We're calling on the government also to support stronger education measures in school and to support parents, because mm. as Richard said, so many of them feel ill-equipped for this and, and, you know, overwhelmed by it. So we need to support parents to parent on it. But, Alex, if you feel ill-equipped and ill-prepared, should you be giving your child a device at eight years of age? Well, I think what we're finding, and I think mm -hmm. you, you, you would say the same, that a lot of parents are under fierce pressure from their kids to get the device. And but you're the parent. I know, but this is the trend that there is, that, you know, it's, it's become increasingly normal. And actually, we focus a lot on smartphones, but our, yeah. our evidence says that tablets and consoles come earlier. Richard, just very quickly, yeah. I mean... Should, like, if you're giving your children these devices, yeah. then should you be sitting them down and having the open chat? Do you know, you may see something on this. Uh, and if you do, tell me about it. I'm not going to give out to you. Let, let's have an open conversation about that. Should that be the first step? Because they are seeing sexual it and is, violent content. Yeah. Alan, that is such an important thing. And they're going to consume pornography, whether they do it intentionally or not. They're going to consume that stuff. Yeah. And so you have to... And when you give the smartphone, you have to have boundaries around it. We will check this. If you mm. want to get this phone from us, we will check it. Mm. You, you don't bring it into your bedroom. It's not going to be the first thing you see in the morning. It won't be the first thing you see it, last thing you see at night. We will have rules around this. And that's... It's so hard to roll back on it, get the boundaries in there early so the child will agree to it. Yeah. And then you have a, a much safer mm. environment for the child. It's and a great point. Um, it's funny, because I'm not trying to be hyperbolic, but we had a civil rights movement. We've had an equality. <laughs> movement it does feel like people need to go and and take up against these companies and go I'm sorry but you've got a responsibility to us it's it's really terrifying it's a fascinating yeah. report um, 
and it's really stark and I can't imagine how overwhelmed yeah. parents are. And Alex, are. fair play because it's very yeah, clear true. when you're reading it. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. fair play. Uh, we'd love to hear from you this morning, 0896 uh, 111111. I'm sure you're so overwhelmed yeah. with what's happening. Richard Hogan, family psychotherapist, thank you so much thank for joining you. us this morning. And Alice Kinney, CEO of Cyber Safe Kids. Thanks a million for everything thank you, this Mom. morning. Uh, still to come, new plans are set to see speed limits mm -hmm. cut on a significant number of roads, of course, to tackle the number of road deaths and serious injuries that we see in them. Yeah, we're going to be discussing this and other stories that are hitting the headlines after this quick break. Now, there are plans to reduce speed limits across national, local and arterial roads under a major overhaul aimed at addressing a spike in accidents and fatalities recently. And joining us now to talk about that story and everything else is uh, Lorca Nyhan from the Communications Good Clinic. Morning. Good morning to you. So let's start with that story. Of course, we, we got the additional 1.2 million towards an increase in the Go Safe speed detection cameras mm -hmm. around the country. And now they're proposing this. This is going to Cabinet. This is going to cabinet that a reduction in, in speed limits that we're looking at uh, 80 kilometres on national secondary roads are going to be reduced from 100, 60 kilometre limits on local and rural roads, which will be reduced from 80. Um, okay. So that they're bringing down some motorways untouched, primary roads untouched, but a lot of the rural, rural roads and kind of lower speed limit ones, but even lower again. Obviously, this is because the trend has been going recently in the wrong direction. So we have a lot of high profile road casualties um, lately, but also the statistics are showing it is getting worse. Um, so there's already been, I think, 24 more deaths this this time compared to this period last year. Mm -hmm. But if you go 18 to 19 in the entire year, it only increased by one. So the trend has really accelerated. This is something that we were getting right we had fixed. Yeah. It used to be very, very, very bad. It has it got much better. It's going the wrong direction. So the government have obviously decided we have to act. Yeah. And that's one of the ways of doing that. And it has to only be one of the ways is to look at the speed limits. So, and that is proven to work. So that means all the signs will have to be changed on these roads and stuff like that. And that'll be a cost factor as well. Would yeah. You? <laughs> I know, but I mean, we're talking about lives, but I'm just yeah. saying, mm. like, they'll all have to be changed. Yeah, the county councils it, it, will have to bring that It's the biggest in. kind of overhaul yeah. Um, yeah. that they've had since, the, since they changed in 2005 um, to, the, to the metric system. Yeah, and let's just, for one second, it was 415 people died in our roads in the year 2000. Mm. Like, they have done a serious amount of work, but if you have lost a family member on a road, yeah. like, no, it's, it's one too many, of course. Um, but, but with all this, it, does it look like there's going to be any sort of any pushback on this or is everyone like yeah this is what we need to do I think on a logical level most people realise yes this is what we need to do if it's going to save lives I think there there does need to be a bit of a job done on just explaining to people that this will work because you immediately get a bit of a backlash saying well it's not speed it's behaviours or you know, people are going to yeah. break the speed limit anyway but look there's been good in depth OECD research on this that basically says you reduce speed even by a percent and you decrease fatalities you decrease serious injuries by a bigger percentage so if it goes by 1% like it... fatalities got on by four. So, I mean, it, it's proven. So there's a bit of work needed to be done in this. And then also there's work needed to be done to convince people that, you know, speeding or you know, increasing your speed makes you feel like you're making a lot better progress. It but in the grand scheme yeah, of things, it doesn't actually make was, that big go, a difference. Go through it there. Some of it's fine. Like, there like, was an RSA ad, a radio ad about this that really stuck in my mind. Yeah, you were and saying And it really that. worked for me. So, to, so go through for so people at home. Yeah. So this is from the Road Safety Authority, that if you speed by 10 kilometres an hour on an 80 uh, kilometre per hour road, you save 68 seconds of over a journey. An average journey at 60 kilometres an hour instead of 50 kilometres an hour saves two, two minutes, minutes and 44 seconds. Yeah, three minutes. But, you know, what are you going to do with that two minutes and 44 seconds? Doing? So there does need, people need to be told these kind Amazing. of figures. They need to be talked through them. And just, it's the risk reward factor. Mm. You might feel a bit better because you feel like you're making more progress. Mm. The increase in progress is very minimal. And actually the impact on somebody's life, be it a pedestrian, be it your own, be it somebody in your car, be it another yeah. car, the, the percentages are very clear that any increase in speed on the average across the road it, yeah. massively it's increases. Just, it's just amazing, even complete, completing a journey at 110 kilometres, and if you slow that down to 100 kilometres, it's 45 seconds you've only you've saved. Yeah. Yeah. So come down that 10 kilometres, and mm. you're literally 
You're and saving I, 45 seconds. That's nothing. And I do think it's important day. for people to realise as well that motorway, motorways and primary roads are not being touched on exactly. this because they're safe roads, etc. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's it's country roads, it's rural roads, yes. it's urban, it's urban built up areas. It's the kind of areas where yeah. you really don't need to be speeding exactly. anyway. Yeah. We'd love to hear from you on this this morning, what you make of these proposals that are being brought to Cabinet 0896 111 and how you feel like maybe that, in all fairness, people feel very aggro on the roads after lockdown. So how you think that's going? Now, the government have been accused of repeating past mistakes. I feel like we're getting Celtic Tiger warning bells. What's going on? Mm. We're getting real Celtic Tiger warning bells from this. So the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council, which is a council that is set up by the government, it's independent, but is appointed by the government, relatively heavy hidden economists who have given their pre-budget submission. And they've said a couple of things, but the, the most interesting thing that they have highlighted is that they feel the government is repeating the past mistakes of during the... In the in the, in the Celtic Tiger, huge tax coming from the yeah. housing market that was used to fund current expenditure. So it was used to fund tax breaks, it was used to fund increases that were every single year, not big capital outlays, but mm. current expenditure. They feel they might be repeating those same mistakes by looking at the corporate tax windfalls and using those to do one-off cost of living measures, using those to fund tax breaks um, or tax cuts, using those to fund increases in current expenditure in particular. So. They're saying we're looking at doing the same thing again. The government argue they are saving more, they're not doing it as badly. So yeah, that's one element. The government has its own cap on the the, the increases, 5%, but in this in this budget it will be 6.5%. Yeah. And we know that. They've yeah. already said that. And their projections out for the next number of years are also to break their own yeah. um, cap. Which I think when people look at it, it can be a little bit frustrating when the government sets their own um, cap, and, like it when they set it. their own targets and then don't meet their own targets or breaks their own <laughs> cap. They've decided this is kind of prudent uh, financial policy, but then political pressures of the day, of the pressures of the citizens, the pressures of the opposition say, yeah, 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 with the rules, but... An election, yeah, we have the rules, An but. election next year. <laughs> yeah, so the, the Fiscal Advisor Council has also said they shouldn't be spending on capital expenditure. That, to me, is a bit more controversial because I think there is an argument to be made that it is worth overspending if it's on green energy, if it's on infrastructure, if it's on things we're going to have in 20 or 30 years' time yeah. that will actually lift people, that will actually improve the country long term. So that one, I'd have a bit more sympathy for the government to push back on, but on the current expenditure, even though all the opposition will want more current expenditure, even though people will want more current expenditure, the government has to make unpopular yeah. decisions and yep. just say mm -hmm. no. No, that's it. Uh, the government says no. What happened to the Great Wall of China? There was two workers <laughs> who... They were maybe here and they wanted to go, they had to go all the way around the wall, all the way around the wall. And they said, I, why am I going around this wall? I think I should just go through it instead. So there was a small, <laughs> there was a small hole and they basically just barged through the wall because they were sick of going all the way around. Um, and they wanted to, they wanted a quicker route to go through. So they took a shortcut through the Great Wall of China. I think it shows that kind of the closer you are to something majestic and, and wonderful, the more ordinary it seems. <laughs> if you're seeing it every day, you're saying, seen, it's you've just seen a, the Great Wall of China yeah, every day. Wall, yeah. That's probably not the nicest bit of it anyway. You know, it's probably the, the, the <laughs> more run down bits. They've been dead. They've been arrested. Of yeah. course they've been. I know. I know. They've China. Been I know. I think anywhere. I oh, think my God. I, I, think it, I think if somebody went straight through Newgrange, we'd probably arrest them as we well. We have an issue know? with that. Yeah, we won't be mad I do know it. students who once took a sledgehammer between uh, houses. There were two houses. Instead of having to walk around, they went straight through the wall, and that's how they lived for the year. This was in UL. Um, so we're wondering. <laughs> shortcuts. It doesn't have to be about a wall. Maybe you trusted Google Maps one day, and you're like, that did not work. 0896 111. Triple one. What were they thinking? Listen, Lorcan Lyon from the Communications Clinic, thank you so much for joining us thank this morning. Thank you very much. And now, after the break, we are heading to Tommy in the K Club, where he'll be chatting to not one, but two All Ireland champions from the world of football and hurling. See you after this break. Welcome back to Ireland AM. Now, Tommy, doesn't he always bring oh, his A game, especially when he gets away from us too? It's grand. He's at the K Club this morning. Yeah, how are you getting on, Tommy? About your loving they've been down there this morning. I am absolutely loving it, guys. Yes, you enjoy yourselves together. I'm having the time of my life down here at the K Club for the Irish Open. And I'm even happier now because, because I am joined by two All Ireland winners. It is, of course, the Limerick Hurling Captain Keen Lynch and Dublin footballer Dean Rock as well. Good morning to you both, lads. Uh, how are you feeling ahead of the golf today? 
a lot of nerves. I'm trying to teach uh, Dean a thing or two here to uh, show him how to hit it, but not nervous, excited. Um, okay, well, let's, let's get started with you. I mean, it's what, six weeks since lifting the All Ireland title um, as co captain, your fourth in a row. Pretty incredible. Yeah, unbelievable. Unbelievable. A few weeks since as well, like trying to the week after, kind of enjoying the crack and straight back into the club championship and just trying to enjoy life as well. Do you know, and the stuff outside of Ireland too has been great. And with Declan Hannan as well, co-captains, like you've had a difficult enough time over the last couple of years with injuries. Like, does it make it that bit more special, kind of missing out and then coming back and be able to actually lift up the trophy again? Yeah, sure, it's unbelievable. Like, obviously, last year I was in Declan's position. He pulled me off the pitch and walked me up the steps of the Hogan's End, and it just it just made my year. Like, I know you miss out on a lot being injured, but just for him to do that, so to have the opportunity to bring him up is just something I suppose that. I see how much I appreciate it, so I wanted to do that for Dick as well because he's an unbelievable leader for each and every one of us. So, top class, very enjoyable. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you could see the bond between the, the whole group of you, and to do that just I shows, shows, I suppose, how you have such a winning mentality between the lot of you. Dean, let's start with you. You're eighth All Ireland. The dubs are back, and given, I suppose, the adversity you've had over this year, it made it more special. Yeah, no, it was, a, it was an amazing year for, for the group, obviously. Coming out of Division 2 was a massive objective for us this year. We, we did that and probably were written off or not expected to go as well as we did in the all Ireland Championship. But we got, got momentum and got things going at the right time and thankfully got over the line in a, in a great final against Kerry. It was, it was a great final, all right. It was a pretty special day for you as well to come on and be a part of winning that winning for the dubs. But also it was your daughter, daughter Sadie's first birthday. Uh, I mean... How was that? Was uh, the birthday celebrations pushed to the side for the day? Yeah, so I suppose I was in a totally different position that time last year, the year, the year previous uh, when Sadie was born. But look, it was an incredible, incredible couple of weeks from obviously Sadie's first birthday, win the All Ireland, to, to getting a stag in, in in the middle there, and then and then the <laughs> wedding then as well. So it was and club uh, championships in the and middle club too. Ch club championship as well. Yeah. So look, it was a very very busy time, but uh, yeah, I don't think those couple of weeks will ever be repeated. So it was a very special time. In our oh, lives, incredible, you know. and something you'll really look back on with such fond memories as well. Obviously, you've won eight All-Ireland titles. I mean, what's next for the Dubs? What's next even for you? Yeah, look, as the, you, you weigh things up over the next couple of weeks and months, obviously, as Keane said, everyone's back to the club now, club championship now on s Sunday. If we, if we win that, we're through to a quarter final. If we lose, we're gone. But, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens over the next couple of next couple of months. But, obviously, Dublin have massive attention. A lot of the young guys coming through again. So, um, you know, maybe another six in a row. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Here we have it. We are four in a row at the minute, Keane. Like, in terms of, obviously, club is really important for you. And we saw Derek was down at your local club recently. There's such a bond there. But for you to try and step away from it, to relax, do you enjoy getting out to the golf course? Like, we're here at the Pro-Am. Do you get a bit of practice in? <laughs> Big golf do, I, do, I, do I enjoy it? I know, it's unreal. I suppose it is a way of switching off. Because you're kind of all go, whether it's ending the senior or the county championship with Limerick, going back to the club. So going off for a few holes, a few games of golf throughout the week is something that you can just switch off built as hard as you can and no one watching but today's a different story now we'll see we'll see where they end up <laughs> there's going to be a lot of crowds here to watch here as well coming up nice and close they're nervous way in the belly can't it uh, I chatted to Henry Shefflin there last year as well and he was well he might say giving me a golf lesson but uh, is it difficult with the difference of the grip and stuff because everybody just expects hurlers to be so so good yeah I don't know I suppose you, I'm the exact same I hold it I hold the hurley so it's probably, probably, it's probably the right way to, to hold it because I have the wrong hurley grip but Okay. I don't know. It's it's actually it's enjoyable. Like I suppose a lot of hurlers go. Out, we were saying it there while we try and hit it as hard as we can, and it probably doesn't go where we want it. So I'm gonna try to change that tactic today and I'll see what happens. <laughs> so you actually hold the hurl the wrong way. You hold it the golfing way. I wouldn't say yeah. I hold it the golfing way. I have the left hand. Okay. Right, top, okay. Yeah. That's the key to the success. <laughs> and, it's different. Uh, it's not what it's John Kiley's the got them all doing yeah, that. That's the key to it. Uh, you got married here only a couple yeah. of weeks ago as well, Dean. Like, it's a special place. Must bring, bring back a lot of great memories. Yeah, look, yeah, we got married here three weeks ago, so it was an incredible, incredible time. And uh, look, yeah, it's a beautiful place. The course looks incredible. So uh, we're going to have a good day, I think. Uh, do you get nerves, though, when you come back here? Like, when you were driving in today, were you thinking about the golf today? Were you thinking about the wedding? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just thinking about the golf and we're playing with Keane today now in France. I can't wait to see him tee up on that first hole. Uh, yeah, well, listen, I think we're very, very much yeah. excited for that he says as well. He has me today, so we'll see. Well, there's a bit, is there a wager on this? Who's got the longest driver? Longest Who's going to win overall? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah. Maybe for putting competitions, well, we'll see. Um, you, have you ever played in any of these programs before? Like, do you play 
golf. I mean, Desi Farrell, your coach is here. You are telling him, yeah. right, Ron, sure, he must be flying this. He plays golf every week. He does, yeah. I don't think that the, the inter-county game now, there's no time for golf or extracurricular stuff. It's all it's, it's all go in season. But yeah, look, whenever you get a chance to get out and play, absolutely. But uh, first time at an event like this, so uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, what is it like having, obviously, you married to Neve, former Dublin footballer as well. The Dublin ladies won this year as well. I mean, success really breeds in your family at the minute and having Sadie as well like are you excited for her to hopefully pick up a ball as well she's only yeah, one of the she's, early she, days she's under a bit of pressure she's yeah. tur tur 13 all Ireland's between myself and Neve, so she's uh, <laughs> yeah I don't know if she doesn't want to play 13. football I'll, I'll understand that's the reason why but uh, yeah look yeah I'm sure she'll, she'll, um, she'll do what she has to do yeah. uh, it's exciting times yeah. well listen we can see I think Paul McGinley's going to be teeing off here very shortly then it's followed better. by Rory McElroy <laughs> and, and then, then followed voice. by Keen <laughs> I mean how nervous is it when you're stepping up here and there's going to be thousands of people here watching you and pretty much dying to see you off the first tee here. Uh, I think we'll struggle to put the ball on the tee. <laughs> the shake shake already, that much, yeah, yeah. I'll tell everyone just move back and just let rip and we'll see what happens. Yeah. I was expecting to see the skinny jeans and the, the chain, the whole lot. You're no, quite... Uh, looks you're like a golfer. Okay. Yeah, you're I have to look the part when I don't have the skills for it, so it's okay. half the battle. Like. <laughs> That's half the battle. Well, listen, enjoy the golf today, lads. It's been a pleasure to have you both with us. Keen Lynch, Limerick, Curling Captain and Dean Rock Dublin Footballer as well. That's all from the K Club and as I said we're going to be back here in a couple of minutes Rory McElroy, Padraig Harrington, Paul McGinley they're all going to be teeing off right behind us very shortly see you soon I honestly didn't think there was someone who could wear a t-shirt tighter than you but Kean definitely has it certainly he? has there's this one, morning there yeah there's <laughs> one person Tommy still has the jacket on he likes them tight but he's uh, in his shorts He's in his shorts, yeah. fine legs on him. There you Great go. Fair play. Fair play. Uh, we'll be chatting to Tommy throughout the morning. He's going to be chatting to so, more, so much, m many more people uh, later on still to come. Uh, he's going to be meeting, uh, who's he meeting? David Clifford, I think, a little bit later on as well. Uh, the Kerry ca captain also to Rory uh, Best will be there. Yes, plus we're learning why switching to paper straws might actually be bad for you. Great. Come back and we'll tell you more after the break. It's time now to take a look at this morning's paper, starting with the Irish Times. Its headline, Ireland risks repeating mistakes of past, warns watchdog. The Irish Fiscal Advisory Council has warned that the government risks undermining its credibility if it presses ahead with plans to breach its own spending rules each year until 2026. Speed limits to be slashed on roads, that's the front page of the Irish Independent. Cuts are set to be made on many roads as authorities seek to reduce the number of road deaths and serious injuries. The examiner also leads with this story, speed limits to be cut to save lives on roads. Limits will be lowered by 20 kilometres on many national, local and arterial roads across the country. Tensions rise over strategy to house refugees. That's the top story of the Daily Mail. Issues have flared among councillors who voted against dozens of modular homes for over 200 Ukrainians, putting the government's refugee strategy under renewed pressure. The Herald goes with teen accused of head stamp denied bail. A young man who punched a tourist to the ground and then stamped on his head in a vicious and unprovoked attack on a group in Dublin city centre was refused bail and remanded in custody yesterday. The mirror goes with girl eight dies in sea swim tragedy. A community has been left heartbroken after the body of a young girl was recovered in a major search operation off the coast of Cork. The alarm was raised just after 4.30 when she was swimming with friends and came into difficulty. The star leads with let's shake on it. Guard the chief Drew Harris is in Dubai to secure a deal to extradite and charge the Kinnahans over major <coughs> crimes. This comes as Gardaí await a decision from the DPP on charges for all three Kinnahan leaders. The Sun also covers this story with the Kin Blue Line. And as you'd have seen in the headlines there, we were chatting about it earlier on, this is the speed limits are yes. being reduced. And this is not on uh, dual carriageways or motorways, but it's like arterial roads and national roads and secondary roads. And a message here that says, reducing speed limits, this is Kathleen this morning, will have zero impact. I live just outside of town where the speed limit is 80. Speeds are well in excess of 100 kilometres all the time. The biggest problem is tailgating and dangerous overtaking everywhere. I had someone overtake me despite oncoming traffic and a car on the hard shoulder. 
And I, both, and we see it all the time. And Mike says, if people don't obey the speed limits as they are now, how are lowering them going to change that? So if you're if you're breaking the speed limit now, lowering the speed limit. Yeah, but if you're breaking it by 20 now and it's 80, if you bring yeah. it down to 60, at least you'll be going 80. Do you know what I mean? Like I like. Well, yeah, I suppose. But if you're used to a route and you're going at 100 all the time, but should they start so catching them? Is there a, is there a thing to do? You know, in Germany, if you speed in certain areas, bye bye license straight away. Really? Yeah. They Your license very, taken off. They you. can be very harsh in certain areas. They've got designated zones that if you're going over 30, like it's around schools, certain towns, and um, they can be incredibly harsh. I think in Germany. But I love this statistics we were reading them out earlier on that like just by lowering your speed limit by 10 uh, 10 kilometers an hour on, like it saves you like two minutes on your journey like so do it well 66 seconds in yeah some 66 case. So seconds it's all, it's all available on the rsa we were talking about it a little bit earlier on now we we're also talking about the uh, cyber kids uh, report yeah. about bullying found that over 25 percent of primary school aged children and 40 percent in secondary school face cyber bullying they also see uh, violent and sexual images online all the time amelda <coughs> says banning phones <coughs> in schools would also improve children's social skills which are shocking it'd be great if they had to talk to each other at break time but you know, it is nice because you see, all, they're all just all on their phones. Like it's a this liar. whole no. every, between every break. Yeah, straight on, just, yeah. Just, but it would be nice. To myself like go out to the like, go out to the yard and play, play ball or do something. Emer says our kids are twelve and nine, and our eldest for the last couple of years has been slagged off for not being allowed to use YouTube. Both oh. children know that we can see the sites they are on, and they've been told that when they get the phone, and they're not allowed to have it in their bedroom, and they can we can look at their phone whenever we want. That's being a parent with a child. But that's on phone. that's what we were discussing earlier on. You're the parent, and if you have that open conversation with your children when they get the phone it yeah. makes it a lot easier but they're getting slagged because i know 0896 triple one triple one we would love to hear you on on this because it's a huge <clears throat> issue obviously we'll be back with you in ireland am very shortly <laughs> Thanks for staying with us. Now, our next guest, accessible and often humorous videos about living with a rare congenital hand defect, has garnered her over 30, garnered her, or garnered her, over 30 million <laughs> likes on TikTok, encouraging important conversations about her disability. Love being garned. Garned, Lovely. garned her. Uh, before we chat to social media influencer India, Sasha Atkinson, about her rise to online fame and the positives and negatives about that, let's take a look at India in action. I asked random people to high-five me, but gave them my baby hand instead. This guy was so happy about it. She was so fun, I love her so much. This girl was so cute. He didn't flinch at all. She said it's just a hand, no cares. This woman did because the man beside her wouldn't. This girl cried because she met love me. Love you, spa man. Uh, we all love the Spiderman at 3 uh, o'clock in the morning, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> India, good morning. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good, thank you. It's lovely to have you with us. And I know that loads of people will know who you are because like the videos go absolutely mad. <laughs> but can you tell us about your, your hand defect? What, what is it? Um, it's called, it's the worst name ever. Like, I don't know what scientists are trying to achieve by making these so complicated <laughs> to say. But it's called Symbridactyly. And it basically just means I was born without fingers. There's loads of variations on how it looks with the hand. But I was just born this way, I came out. Bit of a shock to my mum, but we dealt with it and we're here. <laughs> and you did deal with it because your mm -hmm. parents were, were very good with you um, bring, when, you were, when you were growing up about, yeah. about this whole thing, weren't they? Yeah, well, it was a shock initially for my mum because I was her first child, not just a child. Like, your first child already is stressful, never mind coming out. And it's like, we're, she's not got all 10 fingers and all mm. 10 toes. So, um, yeah, she was a bit shocked. But as time went on, um, they were looking for ways to make sure that I can have the best life possible. Mm. And, um, yeah, it's been great. And I'm really, really privileged to have had that sort of family support. Yeah, because uh, it, it's so, like, it's so tough when, uh -huh. when you know, an able person kind of looks and do they automatically start looking at the hand? Like, you call it the baby hand in so oh, many videos. Yes. Oh, and are they like, don't look, don't look at the hand, what's going on? Yeah, well, it used to be like that. It used to be sort of like elephant in the room. Like, I was always waiting on somebody looking at it. I know that they looked at it and they know that I looked at them look at it and like just nobody saying yeah. anything. Do you know like that awkward interaction where it's like, oh my God, like please just hurry up and say something. Like it was like a stressful thing, but yeah. now it's sort of like a positive thing with it being on TikTok and it's created so many laughs. 
Well, so many laughs. But I mean, when did when did you first realise then that that was there and that was different? You were different to other other kids. Was it um, when you start going to school, maybe? Yeah, like I've never felt like I was disabled type thing. Like yeah. I've always worked to do things myself. I've always been capable in my ability. But I think it's whenever I started going into social situations, I was more noticing my disability then, um, from the perspective of other people more so than myself. Um, and it was probably around nursery school whenever I was getting told off for um, just sticking my fork in the chicken and just bringing a big lump of chicken up to my mouth instead of cutting it up by my nursery oh, school right. teacher. She was probably just trying to look out for me to try and minimise how different I sort of was. Mm. Um, but it really, like, that was sort of like a moment where it was like, oh, I'm getting told off for, <laughs> for that's doing... Stuck in your, that's really that, stuck in your memory. That's stuck in my memory. And walking through the park and an elderly member of the community grabbed my hand with my mum and was like, oh, her wee hand's different. I was holding it like this. And I was like, oh, my... I'm not, uh, like, a, an experiment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, you can't yeah. just violate yeah. someone's personal space. Mm -hmm. And we've been talking today, there's a report about cyberbullying. Mm -hmm and the amount of children that are experiencing this at primary school and, and national school level. And obviously that's real world bullying yeah. and you've had those experiences as well when you were growing up. Yeah, definitely. Like I'm sort of like the last, I think, member of the generation, like I was listening to you earlier, um, who both went out and played when I was younger and then ended up on the phone and on social media and yeah. stuff. Yeah. And I've sort of grown up with things as it's been changing from being sort of like a minor thing to a major thing. And even before I did social media, like there was always things going around, rumours. I went to an all-girls school, so don't even start me on that. <laughs> but there was always something to do with social media and you couldn't avoid it. And as time's going on, it's getting more so that even if you turn your phone off, you can't for very yeah. long. Like everything requires a phone, table yeah. bookings, anything. You need, you sort of need social media. So yeah. I think it's becoming more prominent in kids' lives. Yeah. But were you and excluded? Like, were, were, like the way you talk about being in an all-girls school, I've got a feeling that it wasn't a great <laughs> experience. Well, to be honest, primary school was actually worse for me, like, for okay. physical bullying. Like, I was beat up a couple of times. You were beaten up? Yes, yes, but it stayed on now. Like, I honestly, I know I'm saying this very, like, as if it wasn't anything, when well, obviously it is, but I think I wouldn't change anything just because it's made me more empathetic, I think, um, to other people and what they're going through, and I feel like I have a better ability to understand people, so I wouldn't change anything that sort of way. Um, and when, when, you, when you look at it now, and you're, you're, you're th over 30 million views mm -hmm. on TikTok, and this all started with you just putting your hair in a ponytail. Yeah, literally. Well, actually, the first video <laughs> I ever made was me making a burger but that was like not, didn't go viral, nothing. But then I did the um, ponytail video. And... So we're looking at it now, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was like my, that's my pride and joy video right there. That just sent everything up. I do think everyone in the world has seen that video. Like, I'm not joking. Like, that means I've done a good job. It's everyone. As soon as I was like, yeah, yeah, I remember that video. Yeah, and it was it was so spurred of the moment. I was in my job at the time, decided to put my hair up in a ponytail. I wasn't recording at this moment. And I seen everybody looking at me like I had two heads. But really, they were just looking at me because I had one hand. <laughs> and I was trying to put my hair in a ponytail. They were fascinated by it. And I was like, oh, I need to get this on video. People need to see this. And... That's how that happened. And then you were saying you were at work and the views just start going up and up and up. Mm -hmm. And we talk about the bad sides of social media an awful yeah. lot. Yeah. What is it to you? To me, um, I've always wanted to do something to make the world a better place when it comes to disability. And I've always wanted to try and make the world different from what I grew up in, because I feel like there was a lot of things I suffered with that I shouldn't have had to. Mm. Um, so for me, social media, um, using social media is an opportunity because I want to change the world and it's amazing. I'll grab it with the one hand I do have and I'll take that opportunity and I'll do everything I can with it and I'll just take it to the end because I get messages all the time from all sorts of people. Um, people here, maybe older, kids that are younger, saying that they've never seen anyone before yeah. with a hand like mine. But is, is there some neg there's bound to be negativity as well, oh, like yes. you're saying when you're in mm. school and, and like everybody online because it's easy just mm -hmm. to make the comments. How do you deal with that? I just keep that um, goal in mind. Like, it's not just about me. There's, I'm not just making videos to make a career. Like, it's great that I can have a career doing something that I absolutely love. Yeah. But there's people who are relying upon me to normalise this ability, who watch me and are inspired by me or try and challenge themselves to be more confident because mm. of me. 
what does that random comment matter whenever I've got that behind me? Like, that's what I'm doing it for. It doesn't really matter if somebody says that my hand looks like a foot, because that's usually what they say. Is that, is that the type of comments <laughs> so, they get, your hand looks like a foot? Literally, yeah. Like, I did a driving well, what video. what do they expect you to do? Just stop being a human? Like, what? Do they expect you to disappear? Like, it's really <sighs> weird what these people want. The only thing that can really grow back limbs, I think, is a starfish, and I'm not a starfish, so I don't know <laughs> there we go. what I'm do. That's it. <laughs> you call yourself the CEO of One Hand is Humour. I try. Which is a beautiful, <laughs> beautiful I love term. That, yeah. And, of course, it does come with the role model. Like, we just talk, yeah. talked about it. You wear it really well, though. Thank like, you're you. happy to be out there doing something yeah. like this. I love it. You love it? Ah, absolutely love it. Yeah. And it is, like, you're obviously, you are helping people and it's turned into a job, but mm. also you're getting something. Like, yeah. Like, if it's, we could see more positives to social media, it'd be great. Yeah, well, that's one of the p positives of me doing social media in the way that I am. I'm trying to be a positive force online. I'm trying to um, do something that makes people laugh. It's universal language. Like, it doesn't have to be such a negative thing. Yeah. And there should just be more of that out there. And even the term role model, that's such a, like... I feel like there's a lot of pressure that comes with that. I don't even like to see myself as a role model because I'm human. Like, we all do have Do you feel faults. the pressure? Sometimes, sometimes I'd be very, very weary of what I'm putting out online, like, to the extreme, because I know that there's maybe littles watching me, like, we babbies, and oh, right. yeah. I don't want to be a bad impression. I want to make sure I'm doing my best job possible. Like, it is my job now, so yeah. I have one job to do. Like, I want to <laughs> make job. sure I do it right. <laughs> Going out at 3 o'clock in the morning, like, five stroke people. <laughs> well, I'm in my element in a bar, I do have to say. Oh, I <laughs> love it. <laughs> <laughs> Very well. Listen, it's been amazing. You can find India online. It's, it's all there. Um, like, it's find you online, isn't it? India yeah, Sasha. at India Sasha on basically most platforms. platforms. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's just really enjoyable. It's been Thank lovely you. talking to you. Thank you so Great much. Thank you so much for Thank having me on. So Thanks a Thank million. You. Cheers. Thank you. Now, still to come this hour, David Clifford talks GA Glory and Conor Moore chat skits and sketches. Plus, we've got A. This is Alan's speciality. Yeah, Apparently, I he makes to it make all it. the time. He doesn't even make it into work. He's making broccoli bakes <laughs> so much. So we're going to see uh, that being made in the kitchen very shortly. Yes, we have a lovely dish for you this oh, morning. He was just there going, are they looking at me? Look, look, no, look, it, I'm, look like I'm It's reading. in the book. It's in Jen's book, Jen's journey. Uh, we've got your hump day dinner plan sorted for you this morning. We do. Jennifer Carroll is cooking up a classic and Alan's favourite, something he makes all of the time, he says, I, I Jen, used to make it. It's um, a chicken but you, broccoli bake. Do you know, Jen, when you do it so often, you get sick of it then? Yeah. Like, it was I, like, I actually used to hate this growing up because it was our... Monday dinner. Oh, yeah. You know, my oh. mum was very much like... Yeah, yeah. yeah we used so to do every that. Monday like we'd have this. of a Monday. It was always a stew and a coddle and then... You had to something. be planned. I know, fairness. yeah. You had to be planned. So how are we starting this? So it's a chicken and broccoli bake and it's a really handy one. Again, we always had it on a Monday because we had our Sunday roast on a Sunday and the leftover chicken. So it is a really handy one. So did you, you have... always have chicken on Sunday oh, then? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> always. I know, fry on a Wednesday. Fry on a Wednesday. Fry on a Wednesday. My what dad like... still has that every single Sausage Wednesday. Sausage and bacon and that. Sausage, bacon, Was the fry not the Friday? No. Lads, we're going to be here all day. That was food. <laughs> what was your food dinner on Friday? Dan, did, you do you up? have that? Let us know. 0896 love to know, is there was there a thing when you're growing up and you still do it? Your Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday dinners. Yeah, there That's we go, interesting, yeah. though. Too I often think that was days. normal. <laughs> it is normal, I'm pretty sure. So what else do we do? So for this one, like I said, you can just shred up your leftover chicken. If not, you can just poach a few chicken breasts and make it anyway. It's really simple and you can... I know you said you used to make it all the time. A lot of people do it with the chicken and mushroom soup. Yeah. That's very popular. I just make a roux, a really, really simple roux. I'm going to show you how to do it now. I so would know just how to use... make a roux in a million years. So. All you need is milk and flour, really. So I have 300 mils of... I use skimmed milk. Yeah. Just to cut on the calories. Yeah. And then you just add in your tablespoon of flour here. Just plain flour and a little bit of seasoning. I kind of keep it simple with garlic, salt and pepper. Oh, lovely, yeah. Uh -huh. Just a pinch of that, like a teaspoon of everything. And then you just kind of whisk it together until you get a gentle boil on it. It's just important not to obviously overheat yeah. it with the milk. And once that starts to thicken, you're just going to take it off the heat and add in some cheese. And that's the sauce. Yeah. So it's as simple as heating up a tin of soup. Well, Delicious sauce. <laughs> it is when you look at it like when that. When you look at it yeah. like this, it's just flour, season, milk. Alan says, you going, no, it's not. Can no, opener. Can no, opener, opener, yeah. Makes it a lot easier. easier. Chicken, broccoli, can, <laughs> a bit of cheese on the top, can of soup. Yeah, you made something. Yeah. 
good. But um, and then on the pan here, I just have one chopped onion and a clove of garlic chopped up, and You're it's just on a there. really, really low heat. So it's a really handy one to just, you know, I have my broccoli cooked already. Yeah. Kind of just blanched it. Like I don't like to overcook it in the chicken and broccoli because you want a little bit of Sorry, a crunch, a little bit of a bite in it. Mm -hmm. And um, the mm. chicken, like I said, if you're poaching the chicken breast, it's very easy to dry out a chicken yeah. breast. The handiest way I think to do it is if you get a pot chicken stock, a pot of boiling water, bring it to a boil obviously it's boiling mm. and then you drop it to a low simmer so once it's boiling drop it to a low simmer and then just spoon in your diced chicken so your you diced chicken so you just have a diced chicken breast yeah oh, right. so don't put it in when the water is boiling or it will completely dry it's like yeah. if you put your hand in a hot bath your skin shrivels up really quick oh. so it will cook the outside really quick and it'll be tough in the inside oh. one so if you drop it into just simmering water. simmering water and it only takes about 10 minutes and it's really really juicy because I find when someone says you know they cook their chicken in hot water okay so you're going to assemble this now for us so I'm going to uh, assemble milk, it now so do you put the cheese in there now with that milk? so now that that's come to like a gentle boil just yeah. take it off the heat straight away and you only need to add in I have about 120 grams of cheese mm. here mm. I put about three quarters of it in just to leave some for, oh, for the top decoration on the top now I cook the chicken broccoli bacon it only takes about 20, 25 minutes in the oven, I'd add the cheese on for the last five minutes. What kind of cheese is it? That's just low fat grated mozzarella and cheddar. Okay. And but you can use anything you want, can you? Really quick. Yeah, you could put any, you could use um, Parmesan. A lot of people actually, I use breadcrumbs on the top. Oh, I know yeah. a lot of people like to crunch up a bag of King Crisps. And oh, that wow, just really? be their topping. I uh, hear. Just King so or any other variety you do. <laughs> I was about to tell you, maybe oh, tell you. It's a dumb thing, and I'm like going, sorry, King, what are they? Yeah, What's King. King Chris? I'm Because I, I was like, if they're doing the potato, because I, I would probably... I could use chicken thighs as well, couldn't I? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. You yeah, could use no. any kind of chicken. Like, I just had chicken breast, so I shredded that yeah. up. And uh, I mean, some people add pasta into the chicken bake. Yeah. I just oh, never had that, pasta. Yes. Yeah. I think I did that once or twice as well, just a little bit of pasta in it. It's um, it's a real, I think, old mammy kind yeah. of dinner. It's coming out with a lot of, you've said a lot of things today. Mm. It's like Tommy isn't here to keep checks and balances on you, and he's just <laughs> saying, I did this, I did that, I can cook. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I so know in. I can't cook. So you're layering it up like a That's lasagna. That's right. I just have a Pyrex. This is quite a small one because yeah. it's safe for mm. two. But if you have a large one, you're just going to do your chicken, your bro broccoli, and then just throw in some... So those onions are just sautéed and that's all you want. You don't want them and brown. And a little bit of garlic. Stuff, yeah. You just on a really low heat. Mm. And then you'll pour your cheese on top. Am I forgetting anything? No. Pour it over like that. so. How long does that, because everything's cooked, so how long does that go into That's the what I was going to say, the broccoli, like everything is done for you, so it's really just to heat it up heat for 20, up. 25 minutes, and on a kind of like a 190. Do you want me to take it out for you there? Oh yeah, I have one now, it's And the roux is hot. like, the roux is a lasagna sort of a roux, it's that sort of thickness, right? Yeah, it's right? just like a cheese sauce. You cheese could sauce. use a packet of white sauce or cheese sauce, oh. like Alan likes to use. There you go. Look at you. No. Nice. It's Basty. really filling, isn't it? Oh, oh yeah, no, That's it why I don't be. add the pasta. Yeah. Because, you know, yeah, it has the bread, the protein, the veg. Yeah. And then top it with a little bit of parsley and that's it. And your bread crumbs. Done. And done. done. And so 25 filling. minutes in the oven. About 20 minutes. I'd give about 20 minutes, just at 190. Okay. And then I would add more cheese just so it's oh. a bit more melted rather than that really cheese in there a while. Really cheap. Really cheap. And leftovers. To get yeah. rid of leftovers, yeah. your broccoli and chicken from a Sunday. <laughs> Love it. Jennifer, thank you very much. And it's thank in your book, you. Jen's Journey. Yeah, so the thank you. The recipe's in there. Thank you so much. Now, up next, Tommy catches up with GA superstar David Clifford and impersonator extraordinaire Connor Moore at the Cake Club. Yeah, he might tell us if he's lying about all his cooking as well. Come yeah. back to us very shortly on Ireland AM. Perfect coffee every time. Tassimo sponsors cookery on Ireland AM. Now, Tommy's been living it up at the K Club, getting his swing on this morning. Yeah, how are you getting on, Tommy? How's the nerves when you're teeing off a little later? 
I am going to be teeing off a little bit. Not till half nine, guys. You might want to tune in and see me duff the ball off the first tee at nine o'clock. It's going to be pretty embarrassing, but I'm learning how it is done here. I'm at the driving range at the K Club, of course, for the Horizon Irish Open, and I am in awe. The way some of these pros hit the ball, it is just beautiful. If you love your sport, you would love that. You'd also love this because I am joined by some GAA royalty. David Clifford, the Kerry superstar, is here with me as well, and com comedy genius Connor Moore, Connor Sketch as well with us. Uh, good morning to you guys, how are you getting on? How's uh, the nerves? Uh, we're, we're trying to give ourselves a pep talk, like I keep telling him he's a great golfer, he keeps telling me and that's just the way it is. Yeah. How are you David? Yeah, uh, I, too bad. I hear you're a handy enough golfer. No, no, I'm, I'm not. I didn't get the golfing gene in my family I'm afraid. Um, my brother Paddy is a fairly tasty golfer so maybe it should have been him up here. He's one of these lads that's good at everything. <laughs> Do you know of course he you is. Just can't, you can't like him. You just can't. Well what's the competitive rivalry <laughs> between yourself and Paddy then? Because obviously we see the two is on the pitch together on the same team. Off the pitch is it a different kettle of fish? Um, I don't know, I'd like to say I can get close to him, but I can't on the golf course anyway, so, so oh, really? it's not really there. Yeah, Did you grow up playing a lot of golf? Uh, we played a bit, yeah, we were lucky. We've Killarney Golf Course, um, Killarney Golf Club is two minutes from our house, so we were lucky in that sense, but um, it doesn't really reflect in my game, I'm afraid. OK, well, we're going to see very shortly. I'm going to be following you with this camera as well. Connor, like, you kind of have an unfair advantage. You work, do work with a lot of the golfers, you're on the TV with the golf channels, you're here doing the Pro-Am yesterday. I mean, this is... This is walk in the park for you. Uh, not really. See, I get a lot of tips off a lot of professionals. And between them all, they've all destroyed me. Because <laughs> you're getting one tip off another fella, another tip off another fella. So it's like, I'm, I've, I've about 80 swing thoughts when I get up there. Oh. You'll see on the first tee. I'm sure it'll go very, very badly. But. How frustrating is it? Because when you are playing in a pro-am, you're the one meant to be in awe of the professional golfers. But they probably spend most of the time asking you to do impressions of all the other golfers. Oh, I did, yeah. How Tung Lee yesterday, he see me on the night. He's like, I can't believe it's you. Do Tiger. Do Tiger. So I just walked. I, I actually played all right for the front nine. The back nine, I fell apart because I was entertaining him for the, 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 the nine holes. <laughs> well, David Clifford, you're going to be able to entertain well, him I'll, I'll try. today as well. Hey, David, listen, we have to mention, of course, a couple of weeks since the All Ireland final and that heartbreaking loss, of course. For me, whenever I used to lose in finals, which I lost quite a few, unfortunately, I used to just try to get away from it all, get in a holiday. For you, what was it? Did you get back to teaching? Did you get away? Or what was the way you dealt um, with it? Yeah, I, 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 probably, I got away, I suppose, the week after the game, um, which was a big help. Um, and then I suppose you have to come back and probably face up to the small bit. Um, I suppose we're lucky in the whole GA runs that you're back playing with the club um, a couple of weeks later. So um, I suppose as low as you are after a defeat like that, you still have to come out and perform for your club. Um, so that was a big help you know, to be able to go back to Fossa and, and, and win a few games. And know. a case of just bouncing back, that's the way it is, just move on, next play. Uh, I suppose, look, it's probably always going to stick with you, unfortunately, um, and there'll be days where you get brought back to it or something reminds you of it, but um, look, as you said, you just have to keep moving on. Um, you, can't, uh, you, can't, you can't keep thinking about it all the time, do you know? And that's the way it is, and there's always next year, of course. But you said, you're back at your club, Fossa, at the minute. You scored a bit of a wonder goal uh, last weekend as well. Do you enjoy yeah. kind of getting back with the club, with your mates? That's where you feel most at home, I'm sure. Ah, it's brilliant, yeah. Um, it is a course, and, and we're on a, 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 a brilliant journey with us at the moment, so that's better again. There's a huge buzz around the place. Um, but as you said, to be able to get back to the club lads and, and I suppose get back to the fellas that you've known all your life, is, yeah, it's huge. Yeah. yeah, well, listen, we're looking forward to seeing uh, what you do later on as well. Now, we are joined, of course, by Podrick Harrington, who we saw him teeing off a little while earlier on. But, uh, Podrick, it's pretty special to be here at the Irish Open. How excited are you? I'm just very excited, can't wait. Uh, it's great to come home, you know, and play. Uh, and just, you know, I'm playing very well. I'm probably in the form of my life, you know. I, I think I have a chance. A lot of people are writing me off saying I'm too old. I'm only 76. I mean, I'm only two years older than you, Tommy. So, look, I think, I, I th I think I'm ready for today, so. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, great to have you with us, Padraig. Obviously, uh, you can get yourself back out onto the course again. Um, Rory McIlroy, a big hit. Obviously, the crowd is all here to see uh, Rory today. We're all very excited to get a few tips from you, Rory. What? Uh, how excited are you to be back at the back here at the K Club? Um, just obviously very excited, and you know it's great to be here. Um, you know, and obviously I will give you tips. I don't know if we have enough hours in the day, but I will try. Um, I saw you. I didn't know if you were right-handed or left-handed. It looks like you're no-handed at all. But um, yeah, look, just excited. I feel I'm going to play well today. So. 
looking forward to seeing you, Rory. Of course, a big draw always. But we are here with uh, one of the greats of the, the football world. We're also joined by one of the greats of the golfing world. In his own words, anyway, Ian Poulter. Um, Ian, listen, a special day, but you're all about the crowds, really, aren't you? Well, that's it. You know, it's great to be back. They tried to stop me from coming in, but I just walked in myself, and I've, uh, I'm literally just going to play my own, my own tournament, and that's it. But uh, pro-ams can be nervous, Tommy, you know? I mean, especially when you're playing with one of the greatest of all time. <laughs> Look at him, he's a bag of nerves. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, uh, you know, I think it's going to be a great day. Two greats together. Oh, absolutely. To absolutely. <laughs> uh, and, of course, listen, we have to talk with two. Uh, Jerry Lochnan has made uh, a very welcome uh, visit to the, uh, to the K Club as well. He's just getting his gear on. Uh, Ger, uh, are you uh, looking forward to it? What can we expect? Oh, absolutely. Not much of a golfer now in the whole lot, but very excited to be here, right? And would you believe they won't let me play? They said my clubs are illegal, huh? Imagine that, huh? I still play with the wooden clubs, right? <laughs> Look at those yokes, huh? <laughs> the holy trinity. I mean, you can use it to hit a slitter, you can use it to hit a golf ball, and you can use it to hit your opponent, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a long 18 hole for Clifford, I can tell you that. <laughs> How are you going to be able to concentrate with this fella entertaining the whole way around? The only positive I can take is it'll probably take our mind off the golf. <laughs> <laughs> that'll, be, that'll be one, one positive. <laughs> Uh, do you get asked by people like, to, oh, do me, do, will you do an impression of me all the time? Uh, sometimes, yeah, like, but uh, it takes me a long time sometimes to get people. I saw Very you often, even yesterday, like, the golfer was like, can you do me? Like, oh, I'll give you, like, to the end of the 18 holes. I was like, this, this fella thinks I'm a genius or something. I was like, so it does, it can take a long time. You, yeah. Well, you are a genius, but I saw you do an interview with John Ram even, and you were saying how Phil Mickelson, he's a really difficult one. Even Tiger Woods was a difficult one to get. Yeah. But if you plough on hard enough, kind of, you get them in the end. And Tiger, you see, was... I remember I, g I gave up on him. And my brother, like, lives in the States, and he's like, just stop practising everybody else and just practise Tiger for the next, like, four weeks or whatever, two weeks. And he said, if you get him, like, you'll, you'll, you'll win over America. Yeah. And yeah. I remember, like, when I did it then, everybody just talked about the Tiger impression. Like, so it's kind of like if you have the time to dedicate to one person, the problem I have now, kind of, I'm involved in that many games. There's that many different people you're trying to do, trying to yeah. impersonate Clifford at the minute. Now we see. <laughs> well, the end of the 18 holes, we see how you've, you've got 18 holes to do it as well. Uh, listen, have the family come up at all? I know you have a little fella, Dogi, as well. It's a uh, special time for you guys as well. It puts everything into perspective. Uh, yeah, it has. No, he hasn't come. He'd be running around the, running around the fairways probably. Uh, but it's a great time. We had his uh, second birthday during the week. Um, so the time is moving along fast. But uh, yeah, he's great fun to be around. To be around. Um, and I suppose it takes your mind off things too, which is great, you know? Absolutely. Well, listen, all the very best today. Who's got the lower handicap? What are you playing off today? I think I have the lower, 13.4. 13. Oh, 0.4. Oh, his jersey's number 13. And when I played <laughs> club football at a huge standard, I was 15. I'm a 15 <laughs> handicap. It's just, it's like written it's in the stars. Yeah, it's grand. Well, I'm a 22, <laughs> lad. So uh, I don't even think they have my numbers anymore. David Clifford, uh, fo Kerry football superstar. Conor Moore from Connor Sketches. Uh, pleasure to have you both Cheers. with Thanks, you. Mate, Enjoy the Cheers. golf today. You, That's all from me here uh, this hour at the K Club. We'll see you very shortly, uh, very soon, guys. Back to you in studio. Thank you so much. God, it looks like a beautiful day. Oh. They look like giants, didn't they? The two lads, <laughs> like... And poor Connor in the middle of them. Connor going, all right, lads, come, <laughs> step down camera, step down camera. There is lots more to come in the final hour, of course. Tommy Bow, we're going to annoy him again. He's making more friends on the golf. He loves his golf wins as he catches up with Rory Best and Joey Carberry. Uh, plus, we're going to be learning how to be more eco-friendly in everyday life and get ready to cut the tension with a knife. We're playing tug of war. Yes, we are. Stay with us. We'll see you in a few minutes. Hello, welcome back. Uh, we've got some of your texts because during cookery, <laughs> Jen oh, Carol was mentioning that, you know, when she was younger, there were certain days for certain meals and yeah. she still like that and you had that as well. I had that because I, I was that saying as well. was, What were your meals then? Um, it was always a fry on a Friday. A always fry. a fry on so a Friday. So bacon, sausage, Bacon pudding. and cabbage, I think probably on a Thursday. My mother's watching right now and she's going to be like, we didn't do it that way at all, but, the, you know, roast on a Sunday I've gotten it wrong. Roast on a Sunday. Most people wrong. would do roast on a Sunday. So we asked you, how do you got your meals that you do every day and you're still doing them? Mary says, we always had roast beef on a Sunday, cottage pie on Monday, fish, fish on, a on a Friday, and stew of a Saturday. Love an old stew. And I still that I still do that now and I'm in my 70s. I also thought it was weird when people had um, dinners on a Saturday. 
Why? Because Saturday was like free for all. You go out and get your chipper oh, yeah. with your friends you or your whatever. Stuff, you do yeah. whatever you want. You wouldn't have dinner Yeah, there with was your never your really an official dinner on no. Saturday, no. It's like, I'm, yeah. I'm going out, that's it. Um, we had leftover roast on a Monday, of course, says Josephine today. Bacon cabbage on a Tuesday. Lamb chops on a Wednesday. Shepherd's pie on Thursday. And fish on a Friday. Saturday was what was ever yeah. was in the fridge. That makes sense, doesn't it? People still do it this way, they? Don't must they must well, Eamon is saying, still to this day, it's Sunday, it's a roast on a Sunday. Monday, then it's the leftovers from the roast. Tuesday, stew, so the stew is there again. Wednesday, it's chopped out, chops in the pan, mm. remember that? Thursday, bacon and cabbage. Friday, fish. And Saturday, steak and kidney pie. The fish thing has stayed with us from our from Friday, the Catholic past. Friday, the it? fish and chips. Yeah, I suppose, do you go to the chipper on the Friday, maybe? Yeah, but the, you only ate fish on a Friday. With, in yeah, oh, I know that, but I'm yeah. saying, do you still go to the chipper or do you make the fish? I'd eat a lot of meat on a Friday no. night these days. It'd be a bit different. And uh, we were chatting earlier on about, I don't know if you've seen this story. Uh, it was it's yesterday. It's a mad story. And this is two workers who, uh, rather than go the long way around the Great Wall of China, they were doing a bit of work there. They There was a little hole and they just barged through the Great Wall of China. They bust a massive hole in the Great Wall of China. We had pictures earlier on. Uh, but Jessica got in contact with us and she says, as part of my journey to work, there's a shortcut I can take. However, it's not the most convenient as it involves climbing over a fence. One morning I was running particularly late and used the shortcut. I was wearing a figure-hugging skirt and whilst topping the fence, I heard... Can I imagine? Right down her bum bum. And guess what she did? Universal sign for women everywhere. You just tie a jumper around your waist and you're grand. Fair play to you. Hiding it. Beautiful fashion choice. Have you ever taken shortcut to work that didn't go right for you? Let us know. 0896 111 I do remember someone showing up for the um, for the 6 o'clock show. I used to work on the 6 o'clock show. Remember that? Did you used to work on the 6 o'clock show? Yeah, yeah, a long time ago. It was a beautiful time. And <laughs> I worked with such amazing co-workers there. And they showed <laughs> Much up. Much more professional, were they? But they showed up for 6 o'clock in the morning. Oh. They showed up and Ireland AM was come on. Down here, they yeah. could have. They, someone's like, he was like, no, I showed up this this morning. We were like, oh no, because he was watching in the gym at six in the morning. Oh, I don't no. know. Um, you can get in contact with us, of course, as always, at oh eight nine six triple one triple one. But after the break, we're going to be chatting sustainability myths. Yes. Yeah. We'll see after this. Hello, welcome back to Ireland AM. Now, we've been talking about it all morning. Mm -hmm. It's like when you try to make the good eco-sustainable choice, but it turns out we're getting some of them wrong and yes. the guilt that comes with us. And those choices that we make uh, to tell us if they're right or wrong is Pat Kane. Good morning to you, Pat. Good morning. Um, I mean, we were talking about the, the paper straws that we've all been using in bars and clubs for the last couple of years now. Yep. What's wrong with that? Tell us what the latest news on that is. Okay, so um, researchers found out uh, that 90% of the 39 brands of straws they tested... 90% of 90, them? 90, 90. Mm -hmm. And these are paper straws, bamboo straws, and um, glass straws. 90% of those contained PFAs, which are forever chemicals. The name is very hard to say, so I'm going to call it forever right. chemicals. Yeah. And they can be dangerous for our health. They can leach into the water, and we can drink that and then who knows, right? Yeah. So the best alternative turns out is the metal straw. And they taste disgusting. The metal straw. Sorry, thank you. Oh. But the, the paper ones were terrible anyway. Yes. They were. The paper I, ones were yeah. terrible. There's and no you point know, in having a straw. The problem is know. they found out that these plastics are there because they are a water repellent coating inside the yeah, straw. Yeah, because so it doesn't... Break when the minute well, you start it still drinking. does, right? I know, but it, like immediately. Not immediately. Yeah. However, it means that they are probably not biodegradable, so not as eco-friendly as we thought. Oh. And they are still, they can be harmful to us. So can not I, a great idea. Can I ask you then, how did they become so popular? Why did people think this was a great idea then? It's a myth, like so many others that we're here to discuss. You know, <sighs> literally, you know, we talk about a lot of like cigarettes where they're going to go for your lungs originally when they first came out. You know what I mean? All these things can happen. I don't think they're as bad as I cigarettes. No, I'm not. The they, were, they were once, like a hundred <laughs> years ago, they were marketed as this. So, so you're saying these the are the ones, this is the way forward. Metal this is the way forward, yeah. Now, not everybody would be able to use this, you know, because some people, like, they can't the feel their lips. Yeah. Exactly. So if you're drinking something hot, that will burn your mouth. So they're 
there are, there are alternatives out there. So we have bamboo straws, for example, always organic certified, ideally, because we know then that they don't have the chemicals that can be harmful to us in there. Okay. You know, they're going to so be terribly expensive, though. They're not. They're not. Just make sure they are organic. That's all we need. Well, to cost make, per use, I you know, suppose. You're going to keep them. Yeah, yeah you're going to yeah. keep well, them. Well, I, I know. I've seen some bars now starting to do this, but you keep your straw for the night. Yeah, yeah. but do you use a straw? Yeah, I love a straw when I'm having yeah. a short. Yeah, if I'm having a little vodka. Like a mojito note. or something. Yeah, I, I like a straw. Mm -hmm. okay. I do. Do you not like a straw? No. Just, no. It's super uh, eco-friendly. <laughs> I need a, a larger receptacle. You know what I mean? Just get in there. Let's get it sorted. <laughs> it's called um, a melt. So now let's go for more. Uh, yeah. So let's talk about the coffee cups. Because so, we were getting so good with our reusable. Mm. And then, of course, COVID came and we couldn't use them. What's going on with the coffee cups? So coffee cups... Like everything else we'll talk about today, ideally, you're going to use what you have at home. We're not going out there telling people, like, you know, go and invest on a beautiful coffee cup, you know, a fancy keep cup. No. Use what you have at home. You don't even know if that habit is for you. So start with what you have. This is my very own mug. I have, I'm a double espresso girl. Just about to say. Yeah, and I like the, the shots. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but coffee shots. Um, so this is my own. I carry this. You know, you can go for a very fancy You carry coffee. this everywhere. So mm. if you go into a coffee shop, yeah. you hand that over and you yeah. say, can I have my double espresso on yeah, that? They Do you love get it. a discount? You usually get a discount. Yeah. Which means that if you do invest on a beautiful coffee cup, like a keep cup or something like that, you know, over time, you will get your payback because you're going to be getting discounts. Yeah. Yeah. So, but my advice, as always, is to reduce waste and mm. create that circular thinking, which means, you know, use what you have. But yeah. a lot of people do have their cups, like, and they do bring yes. them with them, like, yeah. like this type of one yeah. here. Yeah. yeah. So you'll have this type of one here. Exactly. They will bring, they bring everywhere with them. Exactly. Yeah, so that is a perfect example. And the same goes for bottles. We all have a bottle at home at this stage. You know, it doesn't mm. mean it's the most beautiful thing, the most fashionable thing, mm. the pattern is not trendy. Warren has a very but big we one. Have. I was about to say, because the one thing, as you mentioned, PFAs, I've got a massive plastic And can we, can we show um, Warren's bottle? Can we get Warren's <laughs> bottle? <laughs> Just as this is Marin, like in fairness, you do. You go around every day drinking this. Good for what? Oh boy! The, look at the size wow. of it. Yeah, that's a My gallon. <laughs> <laughs> it's like our baby. Marin goes around <laughs> minding baby. this. It's my little baby. But it is PFA free. Good. Right? So that's what's important. That's what I hope so, yeah. The BPAs and all of that. So, you know, chemicals, toxins. Free. Yeah, but is that, you know, it's still plastic. Yeah. So, but this is one that's made to be reused. It's very different from your. <laughs> disposable water bottle oh, that yeah. people keep that that they, they keep those in the car and they are not meant to be reused because there's an abrasion that happens in the inner surface of that bottle and that again you know chemicals can leach into your water and you end up drinking that and so that's with heat isn't it there's the, a reaction exactly, between the heat and the plastic exactly. so is they that are, happening with these ones no because no. they're made differently yeah okay great. so the the advice is you know if you're going to reuse a bottle get a reusable bottle and just ditch completely the disposables yeah well, now, i got that in january and i actually like yeah, i don't buy any it. other plastic bottles i just use Good. tap water yeah. and I love it. Filters, now, I love bags. It. I think we've all, I think everybody, it's the one good thing that we've got into it to have yeah. it of. Like, I bring my shopping bags I everywhere know. with me, and I think everybody does now. I see very few people buying, buying bags a anymore. Bag. Yeah. anymore. Yeah. What kind of reviews are, are these good? Are we doing good here? So, no. On, Pat. Hang in there. Oh. So, we're looking at cotton bags here. We're looking at bags made from recycled bottles. As you can see, it says six recycled plastic bottles. That's yeah. cool. So, we're looking at cotton bags and recycled bags. And there's a compostable, compostable one just bag, for yeah. good measure there. Yeah. We want reusable bags at, at all times. So, use what you have. As you said, Alan, we already have those bags, right? Like if so you just keep those using them. Bags but it, in the supermarket. Now, that's, that's, the bags what I, that's what I have. I bought those bags and maybe two years them. ago and I've just kept them. That's the best thing you can do. Now, if you are investing, because every brand under the sun is launching their cool tote bags, mm. organic cotton with yeah. nice little empowering sayings, right? Nice, but guess what? A Danish study found out that for you to offset the impact of the production of an organic to tote bag, organic cotton tote bag, you need to use it for 54 years nonstop. Oh, so 20,000 times. 20,000 times. So you so, think you're doing good. So just what, what, use what you have. You're going to need them because you're going to need them. You don't want disposable bags coming into your life anymore. No. This is 90s. It's no longer the 90s, right? Yeah. But 
Once you have your bags, don't fall for the nice, sexy little messages that appear in but front every of piece you all of the merch time. Is like with the, I know, exactly. I know. Yeah. So just yeah. use what you have. Let's move on to brushes now. I, um, as you do, your amenities in a hotel, and I took the dental kit, and I was very surprised mm -hmm. to see that it was a wooden toothbrush. Good in man it. for taking it. Paid for it. Well done. Love it. Oh, I, I always I take the amenities Absolutely. in the hotel. Yeah. Don't tell me any. I know Tommy Bow says he doesn't, but he does. Um, we're seeing this more often. Wooden toothbrushes. Yeah. Yeah, even airlines now have them for mm. like their business classes yeah. and whatnot. So obviously brilliant. We're talking about a renewable material, so bamboo. It's not the type that the pandas eat, so we're good. Okay. It's called okay. Moso Bamboo, M-O-S-O. -O. Okay. And these are like fast growing, so they absorb loads of carbon dioxide, so CO2. They are brilliant plant, so a great alternative. Now. If you look, they are these example here, you know, the body is made from bamboo and these little, the bristles yeah. are still made from plastic. Plastics. Okay. You need just to dispose of these correctly and then the body you can compost, which is fab. It goes back into nature and so everything. These are happy. good. They are good. These They're are good. good. With yeah. all of these sort of things. Mm. Just make sure of the you know, use yeah. some pliers or something to remove to the, remove the, them the bristles. Correctly when you're doing it. So listen, you're always educating online about these things because honestly yeah. it's you know it's, yeah. it's daunting and we all think we're doing good so where can people find you online you can find me on i am pat kane yeah and I'm that's pat it kane. on I instagram pat yeah kane. i am yeah that's I me that would be me mm. we're using it's all there pat kane thank you so thank much you. for thank joining you. us Her i love bringing this in I love, this cup. I love that uh now after the break uh tommy's teeing off in the cake club with rugby stars joey carberry and rory yeah, best he's having a tough time we'll see in a few minutes such a tough day tough day, tough day yeah. for tommy yeah I have to gear myself up to say this because we are going hard on the puns here. Tommy's been in a media scrum all morning, shoulder to shoulder with some of Ireland's most famous sports stars at the K Club. Yeah, we went full, full on them. there. Yeah. But he's uh, putting his golf skills to the test because he's going to be teeing off live for us now. Tommy, has the nerves getting on there? Warren, do we blame you for that script? I don't know where <laughs> we came up with that one, but yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, welcome down to the K Club. I am here, of course, at the Horizon Irish Open. It's a glorious day. The weather is gorgeous. There's some incredible golfers here on show over the next couple of days for the Irish Open. And I'm joined by a couple of not so handy golfers, even though they play a lot of it, of course. It is rugby superstars Joey Carberry and Rory Best. Great to have you both with us, lads. How are you feeling? How are the nerves? Yeah, not too bad. To be honest, we've only just arrived, so I haven't had much time to think about it. <laughs> yeah, to or be, warm up. To be fair, we were, were meant to be on air about 20 minutes ago, but the lads are still stuck in the car park. Joey. Apologies about that. <laughs> You're all right, don't worry. Um, tell me this you played in the Women's uh, Pro Am last week. Like, this is a dab hand for you at this stage. <laughs> I wish. I wish I could hit it as good as them. It was just such a great experience for me to see them in person, how, hit, how far they hit it, how straight they hit it how easy they made look at uh, golf and to be honest I was happy enough just to take their drives and have my shots in but no it was a really cool day and uh, great finish to it as well on Sunday. And how did you play? Played okay. Front nine, happy enough. Back nine, not so good. Okay, well you're <laughs> playing with the three of us are playing together very shortly. Uh, Rory, you love a, a, a game of golf for three. Um, how's your golf at the minute? <laughs> it's okay. It's like the famous last words. No matter what I say here, it's going to be wrong. Uh, okay, I enjoy it, especially at the minute with the sun. I think the summer's been so wet. It hasn't really mm. been that enjoyable. Um, but we haven't been out in a while, so no. you must be working quite hard, are you? I'm working quite hard, so don't be expecting <laughs> much today. Listen, we have to say, the last time we were chatting to you, of course, it was down in Kong, County Mayo, with your Miles to Mayo, raising money for Daisy Lodge. You raised an incredible 2.4 million euro. And the government have now upped that, I think. Have they added another seven and a half million? I mean, how incredible yeah. is that for yeah, you? Yeah, look, Tommy, it's been brilliant. I think the support we've had along the way and, and you guys um, really helped that, really pushed that, because there's only, you know, we walked, and it was a, at times it was a good walk. I think you struggle a little bit when you walked with us, but it was... It is about raising money, and if the people at home don't get behind the cause, then you know, like you'll always raise a little bit. But with that push and that support, it's been absolutely phenomenal. And now we're in a position where 
they're about to put, they're putting a tender document together to go to tender to build it with the view to hopefully having that respite centre in Kong and County Mayo built by the, probably the end of 2025. Wow, fantastic. Like, it is such an incredible venue as well. And even having the Irish government back it as well as a real positive step. Yeah, it is. You know, the sort of 2.4 million we've raised over the two walks, but them and the Irish government come in and they inject it seven and a half million. You know, that just gets wow. you from it being a bit of a dream and a, we have to push and not knowing how many years it's going to take to just go and write overnight, you can now look and plan forward to actually build it. Yeah, it like was a really great uh, thing for you to do and I'm sure you'll continue it every year, isn't that? <laughs> That's the plan, of course. Uh, it's been a, a year of some pretty highs for you as well. Joe, you got married to Robin over in Spain. I, I mean, did. that must have been a pretty special moment. It was incredibly special. I actually had Robin's had Nigel on the back for me today. So, oh, um, keeping the family close. Exactly, man, yeah. exactly. But no, it was a really good summer. Um, great to get married, and we had a few weddings then to go to ourselves. So it was a crazy summer, but yeah, it was pretty special. I have to ask you because obviously you were with Leinster, you're now at Munster. Like, how was that? Trying to, did you have lads from both sides at it? A bit of both. A bit of both. Um, so, but no, everyone gets on well. Like, it's it's kind of when you're being in the Irish setup, everyone kind of gets to know, you guys know that, and everyone gets gets on well. So, um, no, it was a special and have, to have friends there and have a, such a good day. And the weather in Spain is always better than Ireland. <laughs> and away from Prime Eyes in Spain as well. Yeah. Any stories the lads behave themselves? I think so. I think David Kilcoyne maybe <laughs> had a bit of a one or two crazy nights. But other than that, it was a pretty tame, just really enjoyable couple of days. Yeah, well, David Kilcoyne, of course, the Irish prop who loves a nice tight fit and shirt more yeah. tighter than yeah. anyone yeah. we would know on this show Perfect as well. Uh, of course, we have to mention Munster as well. A an amazing year, such a drought of silverware for so long. Great to get it to the final of the URC and, of course, to win that trophy. Yeah, huge. I think with the new coaches coming in, it took maybe a little bit for the new game plan to be implemented, but towards the end of the season, it really caught on and it really started to show. So it was uh, huge for the club to get that silverware and get that kind of monkey off the back and look I think we just keep pushing on from here and see where it gets us. Uh, from an Ulster point of view Rory you know happy to see Munster uh, win but disappointing from an Ulster side of things as well even Leinster seeing them uh, falter in the Champions Cup too. Yeah is that a positive or a negative that bit Tom? I'm gonna leave that up to you. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, actually, I think from an Irish point of view it's it's really important that a Irish province wins the URC we would have preferred it to be Ulster, obviously, but look, I think from Munster's point of view, that story of last season is brilliant. One of my best friends, Dennis Leamy, is in the coaching setup there, so looking and watching those guys doing it was, in, was incredible. And look, you're really happy for them. Um, look, Ulster showed last year at times there they have plenty of potential, but they just need to find a way. The way Munster won, was it nine away games to, to win the thing at the end? Yeah. You kind of wonder, do Ulster have the mental resolve to do that? And like, that's what you got to do, got to be to be a championship team. So fair play to Munster for that, finish the season. And Ulster, plenty to work on. And uh, listen, it tees up nicely, of course, going into the World Cup. And obviously Johnny Sexton is back. You handed over the captaincy to him. You would expect to see him start against Romania this weekend. How difficult is it for him to kind of come into this first match cold? Um, like he's shown before that he's been out for long periods of time and because he looks after him so well, he's so diligent with his rehab and working hard, so you would expect him to come back in mm. and, and be very good. It's just, it's going to take... I think that probably he'll have to rejig a little bit of their thinking. He's going to have to now play all of the group games because yeah. you're going to need him to play twice before the play South Africa, and then obviously there's a break into Scotland. But you know he's going to have to then for Ireland to win the whole thing, he's going to have to play seven games basically in a row. So it, look, it, it changes the way he's managed potentially. But look, he'll come back in, and he's such a pivotal part of that team just because he's everything that they do revolves around him, obviously being a night half anyway, but the style of play they have has, has him written all over it. And, and listen, you know Johnny so well, but even for Irish rugby going into that World Cup, Joey, like it's a really exciting time to be able to watch on. Yeah, hugely. I think everything's kind of coming together right now. The form and everything over the last probably year to 18 months is everything's been pushing and getting better to the stage. So it's, it's, it's exciting time and it's, it's nice it's not too far away either from us. Um, I'm sure people will be popping over, there'll be a lot of support going over. So it's very, very exciting. If Ireland were to make it through to the quarterfinals, what way would you like to see it? Obviously, it could have the fr uh, France, who are the home team, or the All Blacks. I mean, it's such a difficult proposition. Is there any better team to try and choose? I don't know. It's, it's hard to choose. I think France at home, though, is just playing in, in the Stade de France. It's, it's, their support is incredible. So. 
yeah, I, I, I wouldn't fancy either of the teams, but look, it's um, it's, a, it's a tough tough gig either way. Well, it's going to be a pretty epic uh, tournament, and uh, listen, never know, we'll hopefully maybe see you out there at some stage, uh, but we hope that the lads, of course, do stay injury-free. It's a very exciting time. Lads, we're all going to be teeing off together in a couple of minutes. I think uh, I might be teeing off now live on camera, so uh, i let you hold that, Rory. I'm going to go get my... Is this a club? Right, OK, here we go. Nothing to see here, right. OK, Martin, we're ready to rock now, if that's OK. You're live on air here at the minute. Uh, Martin Staunton, thank you. Good morning, Don't sir. laugh at uh, this show, OK, uh, this shot. OK. Right. Oh. <laughs> Don't laugh at the show. Don't laugh at the shot. Right, here we go. No pressure. Tommy <laughs> Bow. Watch yourselves there, sorry. Round of applause, thank you very much. Uh, uh, that is all for me here at the K Club, guys. Uh, it is the Horizon Irish Open. There is going to be a lot better golf than that over the next four days. Make sure you come down and check it out. And I'm now going off to have a jolly round the golf course. See you later, guys. We'll see well you later. Done. Well if, done, Tommy. If that was Derek well now, done. he would have had everyone cheering and yeah. everything. Tommy, yeah. you, you got to work on your cheers there. That was very good. That was good. a good shot. Here in studio, everyone went, oh. Ooh. You could hear it, couldn't you? Like it was a clean hit. It was very good. Yeah, it was very, very good. good. Very good. Well, very now, impressed. you ready for the next one? Are you ready for this, this next one? Going sentence? from golf. Yeah, more to... puns, more puns. We better pull ourselves together because after the break, we're learning tug of war techniques. Only here in Ireland, I am. Yes, myself no, and Myrna are going head to back. head. Stay Look with us. Derek. Look at Derek. <laughs> oh, God, help us. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, stop it. Thanks for staying with us now. It's getting exciting out here because it's time for strength between myself and Mary. She's look at my little Test arms. Yeah. yeah, she's going to win. We're joined now by some of the stars from Team Ireland. Tug of War have just returned from the World Outdoor Championships in Switzerland. Yes, chatting to us, our Tug of War competitors, Noel Higgins and Alan Byrne. It's lovely to have you here. Thank you so much. It does feel these days there's proper world championships for absolutely everything <laughs> no like there is which is great there is. Um, and ireland is a competitor in the tug of war championships right so most certainly um over the history of the tug of war ireland in the early 80s were very top out to top top we uh were in top 10 numerously now we've come back down a small bit but it's grown again and we've numerous medals and currently we're the indoor world champions it's 680 and 640 <laughs> Oh. That's team, the team won in March, in Belfast last March. Very good. So you've just returned from Switzerland. So yeah. how, how did you just get on in Switzerland? Now we had five teams over there. We had a youth team and then we did different weights and another from the trees team. So over the five teams, we ranged from seven place to 11 place, which is well, very, play. very so good. So it was like 30, 30, 30 countries taking part. So taking part. 11 being your worst result is very good. Yeah. But you were telling me earlier on that countries like Switzerland, they do this in school in Switzerland. It's a school curriculum throughout their schools in Switzerland. That's mad, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> they country. take it really seriously. Yeah, yeah. They do. They do. It's like so Switzerland. It's like our GA here. It's sort of so big into it. I like, genuinely didn't know that. That's yeah, amazing. Like they, they are the they are the cream of the crop at yeah. the moment. Okay. You know? And um, now we are we're ourselves we're introducing a schools program and we're developing it from national school up into secondary school and. We're in 10 years' time, we'll, we hope to be competing with them. But listen to this, Myron. Tell us about Korea and Japan and people like that. You know, out in, uh, they're called Chinese Taipei, but they're Taiwan. So their scholarship, they're in college. So the more medals they win, the better scholarship the students get. So if they go to these championships, wow. the more medals, and they get cars and prizes. Yeah, prizes like as incentives. Well. Alan is all of a sudden very <laughs> interesting. No, but I was just, he was and literally always telling us this earlier on. Imagine, so yeah. you get a better scholarship, you get prizes, you get cars. But how popular is it here? Like, Because we all at school had tug of war on the sports day, yeah. right? Yeah. Every, all of us there, we got there and we did it. Is it popular in Ireland? Are there it's loads right, of clubs? There's loads that, no, obviously, with the pandemic, every sport got hit. Of course, yeah. And, but it's taken off now with the festivals and all. There's a lot of clubs come back into it. Now, Edinburgh and the schools is really taken off. But, like, every man, woman and child, like, the amount of festivals and, and vintage rallies across the country. Oh, that's yeah, a war at, it, yeah. That's still going on. And the uh, fun took a war. And, like, we're, we're trying to bring everyone in together because it's a brilliant sport. It's so inclusive because anybody 
any size, any man, woman or child. We've we've a team below on Kikini and the lads here from Banastow in County Wicklow. There's fathers, mothers, brothers and uncles. All in. Like all it in really watching. is the kind of a family. family oh, yeah. like, Alan, Alan how did you get involved? I oh, will yeah, the father pulls and uncles, brothers, we all pull and is just from the same community now. It's all the one club like. And is there so. different then, is there different categories? Like what category oh, would you be in, say? Well it all it all depends on weight, like so it just whatever way because we are it's an individual way in, but it's a combined team weight. So it just it all depends whatever way you can work. But I, over over in um, in Switzerland, I, I pulled in an under twenty threes, then a six forty. Cloud in the for the clubs, then an under twenty threes and a five sixty for the. For what does that mean? Do you have team? to have the same weight on either side of the rope? Yeah, just yeah. So, so like the combined weight of all the pullers will will add yeah. up to five sixty, yeah. say, and then then that's Would you it, have to be uh, fighting to make weight sometimes? Yeah, 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 you'd be cutting, cutting and dieting and all to get into weight. Really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. we have a HPU uh, unit, and we have a nutritionist and and uh, strength and conditioning coaches, and they develop programs for the lads because we're actually based in we're based in Sport Ireland in Branchestown, and we have a that's our unit, that's our home base. So all our international training days are out there, and like only for Sport Ireland who are really backing us for developing the sport and developing it in schools. Like, and are they we'll, funding it then? Where they're they're funding it at the moment. But if it's with Sport Ireland, then because I was obviously looking this up, it was once an Olympic sport from yes. 1900 to 1920, and right. year campaigning to get as it back, are get many it back, other countries yeah. yes. to get it back into so the Olympics. So the, the long-term ambition is hopefully within the next 10 years to be back in the Olympic sports, and we'll be competing for Olympic medals. Uh, along with all the other Irish athletes that's I'm out there. not joking. I can imagine, you know the way people sit on the couch and next thing you're watching gymnastics and be like, oh, she didn't act, land yeah. that double oh, axel and you yeah. can't do it. You'd be sitting there going, oh, they're not doing the right yeah. thing there. People would really get into it, I think. Oh, they say. do, they do. Yeah. Like, uh, Alan will, will confirm this, like, the, when you go for a weekend away or for a week away to the World Championships and all that, it's really a family. You make friends for life because yeah. there's that's... an entry limit at 12 years of age, but there's no exit limit for... So you have people pulling well into their 60s and... You meet the same faces a lot, and it's a real big family, family happy tournament. And right. because of the the weight differences, then it's, it's is it all about the technique? Yeah, look, yeah. It's, it, yeah. Yeah. yeah, everyone, yeah, everyone that sees like the Swiss have a technique. So what, what is should it in the we be doing? Games, by the way. It's not in the no, community games. No. We're, we're hopefully to get that. We're hoping to get that to schools get that program into that. That as would well. be amazing. Yeah, because once you're in the community games, Tug of War really Ireland is your site, is it? To go Ireland yeah. and to go Ireland.com for our information. And just before we go, I need to plug that we're having an international tournament in the oh, in Tala. in Tala in November. So if anybody wants to come, they can really come and see. That's in, That's in the basketball arena Brilliant. in Tala. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Brilliant. where are we going? What are we Tell doing? Who's team. on what team? Right. We're going to try this. We need. We need. You're to laughing get... already. Like this. <laughs> <laughs> She's laughing here. Look. What are we going to do, Derrico? Right. Are you coming in? Yes, you two yeah. on that side. We're bringing right. in so the heavies here. Techniques. What do you need to do? The rope is always on your left, right hip. Um, I like the one this right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Okay. Here. Yeah. Derek, yeah. Oh, Derek. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm going to join uh, in. Yeah. We've yeah. We've got about 30 go. seconds. Right. Let's go. Right. 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 So basically, so feet, 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 feet uh, shoulder width apart. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Good. No, Mario. jump on the edge. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no. What? So what is that the technique? Yeah. And just pull like a dog. Pull like, pull like a dog. Go. Pull back. Come on, guys. There you go. Come on. That's it. Come on, lads. Push into the toes. Push into the toes. That's it. Bit by bit. Pull them back. Come on. Go. Oh. We chat to people from Aged in Chelsea. Uh, we'll have the usual Lots news more. sport weather. <laughs> I would totally do this. I would do this. Bye, see you. Bye. 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 We Let's definitely go. want that. If there was a line, there's no line to get us over. We definitely want I got that. To